evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Hello, friends. Thank you all so very much for coming. It is really beautiful to see all your faces, you know, um, just to, <laughs> I, I always anticipated like the first time, like coming back to give like talks at Common Ground, be like, oh, it's great to like be back in town and, you know, chat. But really with the pandemic, I'm just in the bedroom and we're on Zoom, but that's okay. <laughs> it's great energetically to be back with my Common Ground family. Um, it has been, you know, so I moved from Minneapolis back in uh, in May, May of last year to start residency out here in, in California. And for sure, uh, one of the biggest things that I have missed in my transition here uh, has been to be able to be with, sit with, build community with my family at Common Ground. And so, you know, just to be able to see so many old faces and hi, Kathy. AC, Patrice, everybody just, it's, it, it warms my heart to see everybody. So thank you. I always say, like, uh, there are many places that you could be right now, many other worthwhile endeavors where you could be investing your time and energy. But it warms my heart when people consciously choose to take a few moments to, to spend in this community. And, and not just this common ground community, but just in, in sacred community with each other, with with themselves. And I feel like so much of the healing that the world needs comes from us taking time to be in community like this. So if no one has said thank you for you taking the time to do this work today, I thank you. Um, I always like to start as well by just kind of getting a sense of like what the temperature in the room is. So, um, you know, if you I invite you, if you'd like to just type a couple words on how you're feeling right now, literally it can be like three adjectives, happy, sad, cold, hungry, like whatever it is. But uh, if you're able to type that into the chat, just gives a sense of um, like a little check-in on where, on where we are with things. So Junie's content, Barbara's calm and grateful. Yeah, thanks. One more people are uh, typing in, Patrice is reconnected. I was say for myself, um, like I had felt so disconnected for a little bit of time, uh, just pushing and pushing and I'll get into that. And right now I have a couple of days of downtime from, from the hospital. And so it's been really a beautiful process to help uh, reconnect my own self. And I feel like, um, you know, we'll get into how kind of as a society, the stress of this moment can create its own sense of disconnection. But uh, it's just good to hear how other people are feeling. Stacy, relaxed, good. Jenny, cool and good. Mary, content, happy. Thank goodness it's Friday. <laughs> uh, Jillian, grief sweeping through. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see. Good. Barbara, Rick, grateful and thankful. Kathy, kind of worn out, but grateful. Good. Dana, open the lead. Kathy, lots of anxiety. Good. Jessica, wild and heart, calm in mind. Good. And Catherine, grateful. So thank you all once again for sharing. And you know, feel free to chime in in the chat anytime you'd like to. Um, one reason I like to do that is because it helps to give everyone a sense of where everyone else is coming from. You know, if you get any collection of people together, you're gonna to be people who are having a great day, people who are having a terrible day, people who are happy and excited and other people who are moving, greet the process of grief and moving through. And I like to say that when we, when we come together and form this, this connection, the song of the circle, that the strength of this connection, the interconnectedness of hearts is enough to, it, it, it's strong enough when we give ourselves in this way to hold what, what, whatever's coming up. And so it's like giving of ourselves and this, willing to show up as we, as we are willing to show up, it really gives us an opportunity to, to let go, to release, and also to, to receive, like to, to, to lean into the connection that's there. Though, <clears throat> 
with everything that people have shared, um, one of the things that I've been noticing for myself and I'm talking with other folks as well, but there's, um, you know, we've been in this pandemic for about a year now. It's real. <laughs> it has, um, you know, created a new way of life. And almost like going through war or something that has, uh, it creates a certain degree of stress uh, on us. It, there can be a, uh, a fatigue that sets in. Like we've been doing the same thing for so long and trying to get through. And real quick, show of hands, if you, anybody feel that pandemic fatigue at all, the sadness, the, the okay, the just tiredness when they do something different, cool. And it doesn't mean that you, you're like that all the time. I'm not always pandemic fatigued, but just I've noticed it at different times as of late that uh, yeah, that pandemic fatigue can, can really set in. And I was listening to a recent On Being with Krista Tippett and she had a, uh, a clinical psychologist from uh, uh, I think University of Massachusetts Medical School sharing about this pandemic fatigue and how it really does affect, how can it affect us physiologically? And, you know, it can do a number of things to us. Um, and I think that, you know, she, she talked about the fatigue, the isolation, the sadness, the depression, the confusion. And for myself, I was checking in like where I was with those things. And what I realized is that I actually was in a space of numbness. On, I know that the format of this is maybe a little different than how we do uh, other Common Ground talks. Just to give uh, people some context, talk for a few minutes, we'll meditate for half an hour, we'll talk some more, and we'll heal together. Okay. <laughs> um, but when I checked in about like the, the, the sadness, the fear, the depression, what I realized more than anything is that there was this, this numbness in my heart. And the numbness was there because I had over time of like, you know, being in like a really intense situation as we all have been through this kind of collective trauma of the pandemic. And then on top of that, being a healthcare worker, both the blessing and the curse, being a healthcare worker right now, it, 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 especially in Los Angeles, really like the stress of it all, can, it, it, grind, it was grinding on the heart. And so in order to Excuse me, in order to, to manage that, there are times where I consciously and subconsciously uh, chose to uh, take a step away emotionally, like to tone down, tamp down my, my, my sensing of what was going on, my, my, my soft, tender heart, because that was, it was too uh, hard for me to see what was going on. It was too stressful for me to experience the ups and downs of everything. And so recently, the last couple of days, I've had a couple of days off of work now, and I'm not, you know, working these crazy hours in the ICU right now. And I have been, I was really excited about this period of vacation, just some downtime to chill, relax. And I was excited because like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to, to, to open my heart up again and feel, because I had been not feeling for so long. And I, I, I know that you know, my power and connection is through being integrated in this body. And if I'm feeling, then I'm connected to my source. And if I'm not feeling, then like, there's only a matter of time before that energy that has me like push through and grind through a thing starts to fall away. And I am, and life gets very brittle and hard to continue to maintain. So I said some downtime, time to relax, time to connect, time to really to dig in. And I was, I was, uh, I was more than a little disappointed when I turned to uh, open the heart again, turned to my practice again in a deeper way, and, uh, and I still couldn't feel anything. I was like, why can't I connect? Why do I still feel so disconnected? And I realized that at, at some point, you know, numbness to the challenges and the stressors of life can be a, a reasonable response to unreasonable situations. And at times it can even be adaptive. And if not like completely like shutting down permanently being totally, totally, but like stepping away emotionally from things that are too, too intense at a, at a period of time. I think we place a lot of 
a lot of emphasis on being with each emotion and feeling it completely. And I think that that is absolutely uh, the goal. And I think that uh, big picture, it's being able to be with and navigate the challenges of life in a very present moment way is the, the path to uh, liberation. And at times that's an ideal for me that I, I, I just can't embody in this moment. And the stress and challenges of this moment I mean that the wisest thing that I can do is just take a half step away emotionally from the challenges that are present. And so one reason I'm very excited about speaking tonight and having our, our, our talk around Metsa is because in the last couple of days, really, that's been so such a big important practice of mine to help to calm the heart, but also to help me feel once again, to feel connected to feel integrated, to feel like, to feel whole again. And <clears throat> as we begin to move into our meditation, I'll tell you one of the, one of the challenges of, of feeling isolated, whether of suffering, whether it's through stress or isolation or whatever it may be, is that we can get, when stress has us caught, we can get myopic and um, and feel very isolated in how we move about, how we experience life, right? We're away from each other physically. We're all on Zoom where, you know, normally we'd be sitting in Common Grounds Meditation Center. We don't have the same interactions that we have in, at, in, our, in our physical workplaces because that's not there. And so it's very easy for, for stress to, to create and suffering to create a situation that is exacerbated through isolation. And one thing that I have been finding very important and beneficial is the, the healing that can be possible through connection, through homecoming, through connection myself, coming home to myself, coming home to this body, and then connection with others as well. So as we um, start to move into our meditation and Take just a few moments to get ourselves comfortable to sit for a few. And you gotta have your really spiritual meditation scarf on to lead a meditation. There you go. <laughs> As we move into our meditation, I'll guide us through, but really we'll, we'll play with leaning into the felt sense of connection. So we can begin by lowering the eyes, maybe closing them if you feel comfortable. And take a deep breath in through the nose. Exhale with a sigh, release. Second breath in through the nose. Second breath, exhale, sigh, let go. Third breath in through the nose. Hold at the top of the breath for just a moment. Feel the life. Move in the chest and then exhale, let go once again. Now in and out through the nose. Soft, silent breaths. Each breath out, let go, just a little more. Releasing any tension, any busyness. All of the need to do or be anything other than right here, right now.
of each exhale. All of the to-dos of life get released. All of the worries or the concerns ride out on the wings of the exhale. As we're exhaling and releasing, letting go of that which does not serve. Maybe on the next exhale, the body experiences a sense of lightness and the shoulders roll back just a little bit. The spine is gently erect and the head is slightly taut and the sitting posture has its own nobility. Just as we release with the exhale, so also now with the inhale, we welcome in connection. We recognize that each person here is assembled because they have the same intentions for their life. Intentions for peace, for ease, to be free of suffering, to be happy, to be healthy. For as sure as we are of our own intention in these regards, so also we know that each other person here desires the exact same. We may look slightly different, we may call it different words, but at the end of the day, we all want the release of the heart. In this way, those separated by time zones and distance and myriad of other things, we are all connected. In a moment, we will sweep our attention through the body with the intention of 
homecoming of offering this body kindness. And as we do it in community, so also we have the shared intention of connection. And so we take the attention to the top of the head. And with kindness, we experience the top of the head, forehead. The seat of the brain that allows us to think. Awareness comes down to the ears. Kindness, kindness, kindness into the chin and the throat. As we're doing the, this awareness sweeping through our body, again, we're doing it with the intention of kindness so we can even offer gentle invitations or blessings of kindness to our own selves. We just brought our awareness to the head. May this head be blessed. And silently to ourselves, we can offer that, that blessing, that prayer. May this mind be fit. May this neck be strong. down into the shoulders, awareness connecting shoulders. I hold so much of the stress of the world. May these shoulders find lightness. Down into the arms that help us to do so much in life, to type, to drive, to get on Zoom. May these arms experience ease. Welcome to offer parts of the body, the blessings that I suggest or whatever feels most appropriate for you. Maybe there's a particular ailment or thing in your body that's calling your attention that you can offer this metta, this kindness to your own body in this way. Now to our backs. These backs that hold up the rest of the body. 
the home of our axial skeleton. And may our backs remain supple. May our backs remain strong. From here, moving down into the hips, sit bones, the pelvis, the groin, the sex center. hips that often hold so much emotion. May we find ease and release in the hips. just as much the front line of the body, the heart center and the stomach. So much processed in that space. Those gentle, tender hearts May this heart remain gentle and tender. May this heart be fed. Into the stomach as well. Space of transformation in the body. And the stomach help metabolize our experiences in this life. And allow us to extract from those experiences that which serves our growth, evolution, and awakening. Now feeling the legs as well, the thighs to the knees. These laps that have held children, lovers, friends, So much gratitude for these laps, for these old bodies. And these legs be easy. And the knees, especially as we age, these knees that are responsible for bending and moving, carrying so much. May 
these knees continue to carry us as they can. You know, the lower legs, the calves, into the ankles and the feet. What does it feel like to experience beauty in the calves? What does joy feel like in the ankles? Goodness in the feet. Now letting a kind attention sweep through the whole body. From the top of the head, down through the bottom of the toes. And from the toes back up to the top of the head, just kind attention connecting the whole body. What does beauty feel like sweeping through the whole body? What does love feel like sweeping through the whole body? From the space of connection with oneself, or maybe you keep your hands where they are, maybe you place one or both hands on the heart center. Feel the tender, fragile heart beneath the hands. And remembering that 
that tender, fragile heart beneath your hand is very similar to the tender, fragile heart beneath the hands of all of those assembled here and also within the chest of all beings everywhere. The same heartbeat. Connecting with each other through that heartbeat. From this space of connection, we can do something just a little different. invite you to bring to mind something in your life that needs healing. There's no right or wrong. I always say, maybe don't start with the most intense situation in your life, but what relationship, what person, what situation, what needs healing in your life? Often the things that bring us stress and the things that need healing can really thrive in a space of isolation. But when we hold them from a space of interconnectedness with ourselves and interconnectedness within community. There's a way in which they can begin to get lighter. As we bring this to mind, we'll be doing this for just another minute or two and continue to come back to the sensation of the hand on the heart, the sensations of beauty and love sweeping through the whole body and just allow the thing that needs healing to be dropped in the, into the container of our connection, of our community here. In this moment, you actually don't need to work on that thing. It can be our habit to try to fix it or figure it out. And there are times for that, but in this moment, that is not the time. Sometimes when things in our world need healing, actually forcing into them can create its own degree of trauma and drama. And sometimes moving into them is what's needed. In this moment, we just come up alongside of it. Just abide with it and let it know that you are there, that you are present, 
you are connected, you are able to, this connection, you're able to be with what is. Almost as though you're giving it to the community, letting it go into the container of our shared connection. So it's not just you dealing with this issue, but it's being held in the light and love of all these people here assembled. Take just one or two more breaths with that thing that needs healing. And thank it and allow it to go back to where it came from. We bring the mind back to the sweeping of love through the physical frame. As we begin to bring our time in formal meditation to a close, just feel into the heart. What is the feeling of connection in the body? letting go of that thing that needed healing and coming back to the healing of community, the integration of the body, the wholeness of our experience in this moment. And for some, it various aspects of the body bring up their own sense of frustration or challenge and allow the mind to rest on any aspect of the body that is more easy. And if not the body, any aspect of experience that is more easy. But what is most important in this experience of meditation is having a felt sense of ease. So whatever brings the mind that ease that it might fill the heart up. And that is a space that the mind can dwell, allow for greater healing. See if it's possible to retain this degree of kindness and sensitivity to the body, to the experience. So we take a deep breath in the nose. Exhale the sigh. Second breath in the nose. Second breath, exhale, sigh, release. Very 
every breath in through the nose, whole body made alive. Every breath, we exhale, sigh, let go. And now, softly, slowly, sweetly, begin to open the eyes and come back into the space. I like meditation. <laughs> um, so before we move on to our uh, next portion of our time here today, I just uh, invite you to, uh, to move around in some way, get up, stretch, move your body some way, just 60 seconds, stretch it out. Good. We can begin to come back together. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So before I start talking again a bunch, <laughs> I always like to check in with people and get a sense of, you know, how they're doing. Again, again, just take the temperature of the room. So if you will, if you would just type in where you are in this moment, it's a couple of a couple of adjectives, sentence, whatever, either reflecting on how the sit was for you or something earlier. Just where are you in this moment? Mm -hmm. While people are typing, some of the other comments that came in, um, it looks like maybe Rick said agreed, difficult to compartmentalize experiences leave a way of leaking into all of relationships and activities, so true. Uh, Mary said, I work in medical trauma, so I appreciate you sharing, she resonates with me or I am, relates to numbness, yeah, yeah, you know. Grateful to be with everyone tonight, thank you, Mary. All right, let's see where other people are. Um, so Kathy, a lot calmer than earlier today. Nancy, feeling tranquil and grateful. Barbara, peaceful and relaxed. Nice. Oh, peaceful and relaxed. Come on, that man. All right. Susanna, sleepy. Yeah, it'll do that to you sometimes. <laughs> Junie, uh, yeah, kindly interested. Um, iPhone is perfect. Jason's still bound up. Lots of unwind. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Jason. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do that meditation that way and only tap into the thing that needed healing for just a moment or two is because oftentimes the things that need healing in our lives require a lot of attention. And it can be to sit with that thing for, for in one dose really intensely. Um, sometimes it's beneficial, but sometimes it can be too much all at once. And so just touching into it and coming back, touching into it, giving ourselves some space uh, can can be like good medicine. Jillian, open, warm, easeful. Patrice in the body. Drew, hey Drew, relaxed and at ease. Good. Very very good. All right. All right. How am I feeling? <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel good. I feel openness in my chest. And yeah, yeah, I feel, I feel warmth in my belly. I feel easy, I feel easy, yeah. Uh, when I was doing that meditation, sometimes I'm um, like when I'm 
teaching yoga and like I'm stretching and I'm always like amazed at how stiff I am. I'm like, how are you so stiff you teach this yoga? Sometimes when I'm doing a meditation or something and it's like, I've been practicing loving kindness for a little bit, but it's like, I still like, I'm like, man, like, I really needed that. <laughs> I needed to come home in that way. So, you know, connected to, as we were discussing earlier, um, I got another part of the reason I wanted to do the meditation like that is because it gave us an opportunity to go through the body and to bring our awareness to various aspects of the body. As we bring our awareness to different aspects of the body, that helps to increase our sense of connectedness and embodiment. Stress often pulls us out of our body. Suffering, isolation pulls us out of our body. And so coming home into the body, and at the same time, I wanted to do that with a, with, uh, with the flavor of metta, right? So blessing the body. So we're both becoming aware of it by scanning through it. We're also blessing the body as we go through. And one of the things that helps with that is that we often want uh, to offer metta and blessing to other people. But I find that that experience is very limited if I haven't first began with really coming home to my body and, and blessing this, blessing myself, blessing this experience. And from there, I'm able to give and to be, uh, to, to, to be more wholehearted in my giving to others in some way. As we were speaking before <clears throat> about stress and you get caught in uh, our stress response and we can't, and we don't have as much access to the open heartedness of the heart. So we've heard of fight or flight and how suffering and this isolation from the pandemic, not being able to connect with our loved ones, not being able to get up and be and go to work the way you want to or do the different things that we'd like to do. It can create a sense of stress in the heart. And this pandemic fatigue also creates a sense of stress and disconnection in the heart. And so we get caught in that, um, that trauma response of fight, flight, or freeze. So something happens, we fight, fight, or freeze, and then we don't have access to the fullness of these beautiful, wise, open hearts. And when that happens, one of the reasons that's maladaptive is because in a moment, in an instant, that type of trauma response can be beneficial because like it lets us move our energy in some other direction. But if we, if we can, but when you're dealing with like a chronic stressor, like a pandemic that's going on for so long, then the heart can stay shut down for that period of time, or it can not be fully engaged in the, this experience of life because there's this constant chronic level of stress in our worlds. And one of the things that we don't see, or makes it hard to see when there's this chronic level of stress is that there are moments within this overarching experience of the pandemic that we can punctuate, that, that punctuate our experience, these moments, and we can have opportunities to be, to live more fully into our hearts where we're actually not in the midst of, a, of an acute definite stressor right now, but because we've been stuck on this cycle of stress and the pain and the fatigue, it makes it hard to, to recognize that, wait, I can open my heart up in this moment, or wait, I can find moments to open my heart up and feel more connected. And without those, without a, that awareness of when I can do that, and without that practice of coming back and feeling that integrated and, and, and and collect, collected and connected self, then we go through life. And this, and we have this, and we go through this pandemic, go through this time period as just one constant disconnected um, and, 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 and stressed being. And this, is, this is what my experience was when I realized that I had been numb for so long is that I was going through life week after week, month after month, feeling like I'm constantly in this moment of acute stress. And so when there was a moment where I wasn't in that, i.e. a couple of days away, some downtime from work, it was hard to get off of the cycle because I had habituated the disconnection. 
Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, um, I, and I was thinking about how, you know, connectedness can be the antidote to fear um, and how, I, I was thinking about a patient experience that I had a few months back in uh, like right in the middle of like the craziness of COVID. And it was a patient who called him Mr. Martinez. And so Mr. Martinez, he's the kind of guy that when like in, in Minnesota, we would call him the salt of the earth. Like just really kind of, my friends in California don't know what that means, but um, it just means like a re like the, a great guy. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Martinez came from um, he, he came from a Latin American country. Age about sixteen, he uh, his family was fleeing uh, fleeing like uh, terrorism and violence. Uh, he was like the oldest of seven kids. Worked his tail off in school. Put himself through um, through college and um, went back and got an MBA from an Ivy League school and you know, opened up a successful uh, construction company. And he was, uh, and he used that to help put his, uh, his younger siblings through school. Um, and like, he was like a leader, like talking about like salt of the earth type guy. Like, like if you had to repopulate the earth, he'd be on the short list of people who you'd want to be down with that. <laughs> So, um, Mr. Martinez, he was in, he was one of my patients on my service for a while and he had COVID and it was right when we were beginning to understand kind of more the, the time course of COVID. So we knew that, um, especially if a person had certain comorbidities as he did, that, uh, you know, they see a person comes in kind of sick, they can get a little better day three, four, five, and then like uh, day seven, eight, they can really tank. And so it was day seven for Mr. Martinez, day eight for Mr. Martinez. And I was about to leave the hospital that day. And uh, I just went by to swing by his room real quick to check on him because like, it was day eight and well, it was seven going into eight. And um, I was concerned. I'm going down to check on Mr. Martinez. Um, uh, I get a page from his nurse and like, uh, hey, Dr. King, you came down and, and um, check him out. He's not doing so well. Go down to check out Mr. Martinez and I come in the room, like his oxygen saturation levels are like, are dropping. So normally people walk around, oxygen saturation levels are between 195. Um, with COVID, it's, it goes down a little bit like to 94 to 92. You don't really want it to get below 88. And then I walk in the room, he was like at 86 and he was like panting and like working hard to breathe. I was like, this is not good. And but the one minute, so we watched him a little for a minute or two and his stats would rebound up. And I was like, okay, so he's, he's rebounding up. So, so this is good. Like if he stayed down, it would be very, very bad. But, um, but he was coming back up and we did some like adjustment of him and uh, he was getting better. So the nurse and I were uh, discussing whether or not we need to call an RRT, which is a, a rapid response team, which is like um, when somebody is really, like a code blue is they flatline, like they're dying in front of you. An RRT is like, one step before the code blue, you're trying to you're trying to avoid the code blue, so you call an RRT. But for either of them, you get like a dozen people rushing into the room, and everybody's like helping to figure out what's going on with this patient. And um, so we're discussing like when to um, yeah, how to whether or not to call the RRT. And um, uh, while we're doing that, like I go to the computer, I'm like putting in some orders for EKG and chest X-ray and all these other things. And so we we're preparing to escalate. Um, escalate um, cares. And so the nurse is on the phone with her uh, her, her charge nurse, her supervisor, uh, being like, all right, so uh, don't worry. I mean, this is what's going on with him. Don't worry. Um, uh, I'll, I'll call you back if we, need a, if we need to call the RIT. Everything's okay. The provider's at bedside. And um, like I was um, doing, doing my physical exam and I heard her talk to like one or two other people. She kept saying provider's at bedside. And I was like, <laughs> I, I, I pull out my stethoscope. I was like, provider, are you talking about me? <laughs> She's like, yeah, provider at bedside. And uh, and <laughs> when she when she said that, I was like, yo, um, I mean, it's true, I'm provider at bedside, but I felt so like <laughs> this is above my pay grade. Like I'm not ready to uh <laughs> I'm not ready to like run a code right here. And um <laughs> I kept thinking to myself, like she had like two or three other conversations with 
with people like calling x rays, whatever, whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, I kept saying, I'm like, would you stop telling, saying provider at bedside? Like, that's, this is not going to go well if you don't, and you keep telling people not to come because I'm here. Um, and so finally, um, we're still, uh, and so one thing that came up for me in that is like, I remembered um, like how, so sometimes when I get flustered, like in the medical situation, uh, one of the first things I'll, I'll think to myself is, like when the nurse is like, oh, so what do we do, what do we do? Like I, I looked at her and the first thing I thought to myself was, um, well, what you need to do is you need to find yourself a doctor who can like figure this out. And um, I, I realized that like when I get really like flustered, it's easy like to forget like who I am, forget like, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a brand new doc, but like I do like, there's a, there's a set, I, I can get very myopic on just like, I'm just this person who doesn't know any, like what's going on. Like you need to do something that is, that, that almost like denies my own, my, like all the other things that we, that I've been trained on or this or that, or like ways that I, like ways that I know to, to take care of this patient, like the mind gets myopic and it closes down from all that. And um, so then, you know, I remember the nurse, she's like, so uh, what are you gonna do? And um, I, I was asking her, I was like, what, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Like, what do you mean? What I, I don't, and I, I stopped right before I said, I don't know what, to, what I'm gonna do. And I took a couple deep breaths and and she could she could, she could tell I was like super nervous. And I don't, I don't know, it was like the deer and the headlight look or like the fact that like I was sweating through my, scrubs in my <laughs> my water resistant gown like, I don't know how you sweat through a water resistant gown but like I was nervous and then she grabs me by my arm she's like the seasoned nurse she grabs me by my arm and she's like Dr. Kinabeth we're gonna get through this and I was like <laughs> it was like the part in the movie where like the hero gets like his shot of spinach or something like Popeye gets some spinach and I'm like we're gonna get through this we're gonna get through this. And what was great is just a few minutes before, just a few moments before that, when I was thinking to myself, like, what, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I, I said to myself, like, I, I was like, Femme, you could do this. Femme, you could do this. And you got this, Femme, you got this. And normally after I say that a couple of times, it's almost like I hear a voice from the ethers re echoing back to me. Yes, Femme, you got this, let's go. But this time when I was saying, Femi, you got this, you got this. I, I heard a voice say back to me, no, you don't got this. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? You don't have this. And I realized that that limited just me didn't have this. Like this was my first time like in the big leagues. Like I didn't have, but then my nurse grabbed me and she was like, She's like, Dr. Kinebeck, we're going to get through this. And that simple shift from like, what am I going to do? Do I have this or not? To how are we going to collectively get through this made all the difference in the world. And so then she like, um, she like stands next to me and I'm like, all right, deep breath. <laughs> Take a deep breath. You okay? I'm okay. We're okay. Uh, I said, all right. Carla, if I wasn't here, what would you do? And she was like, oh, I would have called her RIT like five minutes ago. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, wait, you would have done that five minutes ago? She's like, yeah, but it's okay. I didn't do it because you're here. So like we didn't call it. And I was like, okay, let's call the RIT. So we call the RIT and I'm like searching for the button for the RIT and like, <laughs> she's like, I actually call the RIT just by calling my charge nurse and asking her to announce it overhead. So like I, I, I've never actually physically done it. I'm looking for like the nuclear football button somewhere. And um, she calls the RT and um, as like, and I remember like, you know, myself, if I'm like, if you're gonna get through this, like you have to, you have to lean into something bigger. Like right now your mind is not able to think through this. Like take a deep breath, like lean into something bigger. And so took a deep breath, grounded in my, in my, in my feet. 
And then I started calling on my, my guides, my supports, you know, people in the world who have helped to like get me through life. And why it's so funny is because like I was, like, I was, I literally thought and called on like Mark and Wynn and Stacy and Shelly and Rick and Barbara. And I was like, and I do this all in my mom. She's big. I do this all the time when I'm like really like flustered with stuff. I, I envision these people standing behind me and then being like, all right, you can get through this thing that you're getting that, that is in front of you, but you need to release the heart into something bigger. So, so that happens. And then it's almost like a switch went off in the brain and I'm able to like see what needs to happen. It's like clear, you know, you, you, uh, we need to adjust the, the ball, the, the, the bag on the, 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 the mask on and make sure the leak is down. We need to get uh, a CBC order for those labs. We need to do this. And as people are coming in, I'm helping to direct them and being like, okay, you know, Kiana, I need you to get ready to push these medications and Trevor, you got to get ready to do compressions in case we have to put pads, we put pads on them in case you have to like, um, in case we have to, in case we have to shop them. And that, as all that's happening, um, you know, he starts to stabilize, get a little better. And there's this like collective sense in the room, like, okay, we're here. Like we work together, we were connected, we're able to do it. And I didn't feel like this, you know, this myopic sense of myself his oxygen saturation started coming back up. It's back in the, like the lower, uh, low 90s. I'm like, okay, some more people are coming to be here soon. And just as soon as I like my mind clicked and I was like, all right, things are good. It was almost as though like his lungs could hear me counting my chicken before they're hatched. And they're like, oh, really? And then his, his oxygen saturation started to tank again. And he, he wasn't doing so well. He's going down into the 70s now. And I'm like, uh, at that point, like I had done like all the things like I could think to do. And um, I remember thinking to myself, just like wanting to like escape the room. Um, <laughs> and I was like, if I take my name tag and badge off right now and just hid behind the IV pole, I wonder if any, if nobody would notice me. Let me just, let me just get away here. Um, but I, obviously I couldn't do that in that moment. And then I said, just, Femi, like, just, 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 just remember, like, there are enough people here that you, that you all can work together to, uh, to figure out what needs to happen. Um, and after like another, it felt like 10 hours, but it was probably like another 30 seconds. I look up and then I see like one of my senior residents, Carlos, and um, a couple other, uh, our fellow who's like above all of us and, like the cavalry is coming and like I could have like like yeah I could have I could have I could I could have cried tears of joy in that moment like just to I, I felt energetically like I wanted to collapse into like them coming because it was like they were they're here like the support is here the it, it's not just me having to figure this out but there's more there's something bigger and broader that that can hold this experience. And as they come in, <laughs> remember Carlos comes to the door and he's like trying to give him the story as he's getting his PPE on. Um, and <laughs> he's like, so what's going on? And the first thing, like in my mind, I started to complain to him. It's like, where have you guys been? I've been here for by myself. And then this mean nurse, she keeps calling me the provider at bedside and I just want to go home and like, leave. <laughs> <laughs> but I collected myself and I was like, Carlos, uh, his oxygen saturations are dropping. We won't know what's going on. Uh, we just need you to come on in here uh, and, and help out with that. So the team comes in, we're able to help, um, they're able to help figure out, you know, what we need to do with ventilation and saturation levels. And, um, and he does, and his oxygen saturation levels start to stabilize a lot more, a lot better. So uh, he's breathing better, he's easy. Um, and he is able to, and uh, we're able to stabilize him. The team's able to leave and the patient starts to do much better. And the thing that when the fellow and everybody's in there trying to like figure things out, the thing that was 
that kept coming uh, that that made the difference was he was asking me the fellow was asking me like oh well you um do you have you know what about this what about this oxygen such what about his ventilation what about this and he asked me a question about his his oxygenation not ventilation um and i was like oh well we need to change his fio2 uh this is a setting on the ventilator and he's like exactly that's what you need to do and and we changed that and that's the thing that made it help them go help them get better and why that was powerful for me is because it was like, even though the fellow was there, my senior resident was there and all the other people were there, like the thing that made the difference was, wasn't anything that anyone else who wasn't outside the room did. It was being able to, to settle down and lean into what I knew in the moment, what I knew, but could it didn't have access to in the moment because the heart was so contracted in fear. And there are plenty of other times when like the fellow or other people were teaching me things on top of things that I don't know. But in that moment, it was by, by calming the mind, collecting the mind, I was able to have access to something that was already there, but I, I couldn't reach for because I was tied up in knots. The team ends up, um, we stabilize him and, and he leaves and they leave. And things go, you know, things go well. But you know, I think about that situation and how, like, it was almost it was almost comical how, like, the fear of that situation was cutting me off from from both wisdom and open heartedness. Like, you know, there's a a good book says both fear and love cannot coexist. And you think about like here, man. Uh, speaking about cultivating metta, I feel like like the heart can't be open. The heart can't be can't be expansive if it's gripped in fear. And how like in any moment we are like we're cultivating something, like we're cultivating. We can either cultivate uh, fear, looking at all of the things in our society that are going wrong and the challenges that we have and, uh, or we can recognize those things not to deny them and pretend they don't exist. That's also another fool's errand. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am suggesting is that my, my understanding and, and recognizing and, and identifying what's going on in the world, I ask myself at times, am I doing it with a heart that is furthering its, the grip of fear on my heart? Or am I doing it with a mind that is uh, getting the necessary information that I need, but also having access to having access to the beauty, the wisdom, the larger aspects of me? Like, what what am I cultivating in my world? And I feel like there are direct and indirect ways to to cultivate this heart mind, like to stay more connected. Sometimes like fear or whatever can eject us from the body, can keep us from feeling into what, we, what we're there for. And I don't even think that it, it but I do know that when I, I, settle, I settle the heart, settle the mind and come back, then I'm able to, again, not be so one gripped in fear, but also uh, tend to my life and tend to the situations and circumstances in a way that I was not able to previously. I'm able to live more wholeheartedly I'm able to live with more wisdom. Uh, I'm able to live more fully into this life and less disembodied. And so in a moment, I'm gonna pause and just give us the time, uh, a couple minutes to reflect on anything that anyone wants to share. But uh, in just thinking through my own process with, uh, with Mr. Martinez and, and, and that experience in the hospital, like it's though that instance is like it was an acute moment acute instance of being gripped in fear and then i think the the same physiology is present when we talk about a prolonged experience like the pandemic or like a stressful relationship or like a a car accident or like whatever it is that you know fill in the blank and the question i have for team for each of us is you know, how are we, how are we cultivating uh, the heart prior to these moments occurring? 
so that we do the work, we do the cultivation, we have the bhavana ahead of time, so that when they do occur, we can call on whatever practices help to expand the mind, expand the heart, so that uh, we can in some way free ourselves from the grip of fear. Ashe. So um, I'm about to open it up now for any, um, any questions, comments, thoughts, reflections. We have about uh, 10 minutes, so probably about seven minutes before we close. Um, if anybody would like to share anything. Thanks for that question. I think that it hits on, perfectly on one of the one of the things that I wanted to not make sure that we didn't lose sight of in this talk, because again, especially in the spiritual community, the idea can be just open up to what is, just open up to what is, just open up to what is, which can be a good thing. And uh, like Susanna speaks to uh, in terms of her own wisdom, when you are in the middle of the chaos, and it's truly an unsafe situation, that's not the moment to open up super wide, super broad. Um, you know, which is one of the reasons why with, uh, with various practices, but specifically with Metta, like the, traditionally the teaching is taught that you, you, you create the causes and conditions for Metta practice, right? You set yourself up so that you're comfortable. You do things so that the heart feels like you want so you're physically comfortable go to the bathroom eat whatever but then also like the, you, you start with a certain degree of uh of emotional spiritual connectedness and comfort so that you're not opening and exposing a heart to be unnecessarily hurt, hurt and damaged by the rawness of what's in front of it in that moment and it's also why in the meditation, why I wanted to practice both opening up and closing, because I, I actually think closing is every bit as important as opening. The problem isn't that the heart closes or the heart opens. The problem is when we, at times like the sensitivity enough to lean into the moment, to tell, to tell ourselves or when to open or close. Right? When we zig when we're supposed to zag, when there isn't the wisdom to, to, to open when we're supposed to open or close when we're supposed to close. And I've been so guilty of that in my own life at times. But you can think about this in relationships when it's like, you know, you open yourself up to a person where you know what, that might not be the wisest thing. Or you close yourself off to people who are actually like that, that person is actually pretty, very good for like my healing and, and, and homecoming. But for whatever reason, uh, we can get caught in a cycle of um, uh, that keeps us disconnected from our present moment awareness and making the wise decision for what's in front of me right now. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's, that, that's a great example because of both of them. Like one, uh, with the dog barking, it shows how ostensibly something that would have otherwise created frustration, tension in the heart, in the mind, now, uh, is greeted with a different response. Well, what's the, what's the difference? Was the stimuli different? Was the dog's voice different? Was the, your dad's voice? No, it was like the heart was different. The heart that's receiving this, ex this experience is different. And you know, it speaks to the beauty of doing this work because we can't change all the stimuli that comes to us at all times. What we can do is cultivate the heart mind. And in cultivating the heart mind, uh, we can receive what's in, what's in front of us differently. And by doing so, we can transform that experience. Uh, we talk about how like, it, it, it went from being something that would have otherwise been annoying to something that is, was now like a greater source of deepening your expression of an open heart, which I think is absolutely beautiful. Um, and then just like the simplicity of like the cash register example, it's like the, it reminds me how oh, there are examples of metta and kindness and love all day, everywhere throughout our lives. And it can be hard to see it because so much of our attention can be on the fact that we're on Zoom or the fact that we, we're in the pandemic or the fact that we don't have things the way that we would like them to be. 
And all of that is important and necessary and real to recognize and experience, not saying we, we deny any of that in any way. And there are moments in, when that overarching experience of the pandemic can get punctuated with moments of respite, like seeing beauty at the cash, res cash register, or I'm walking through the hallways and I'm checking in on this one patient, I see a nurse and she's combing the hair of one of my demented patients who hasn't had a bath in three days. And I'm like, that is just simple and small and beautiful. And it's like, it's, they're just, there's, there's beauty everywhere. If we would really allowing the heart to open up to that, setting the attention so that it sees these things and then consciously you know so the heart unconsciously um can open to beauty it actually intense beauty intense pain we unconsciously uh, open about this but the heart can unconsciously open to beauty unfortunately if we're in this mode right here what happens more often is that we um is that we unconsciously ignore the beauty because awareness to the pain is what keeps us physically safe right but by doing this by doing these practices and setting the intention as we move throughout our lives, then we're more aware with our attention that this or this or this brings beauty. And then we can open the heart, fill with that thing, get the embodied sense of what that's like in the, in the physical form and then move through life just a little kinder and with greater ease. Thank you. <laughs> it's about 6.30 right now or actually it's 8.30 in Minnesota. Um, so as we begin to um, uh, close out our time here, probably just another like two or three minutes, let's just um, invite everybody to just uh, lower their gaze one last time. Take like 30 seconds, put a hand on the heart. Deep breath in through the nose. Exhale with a sigh. Now in and out through the nose. And just feeling into the sweetness of this moment. Feeling into the beauty that is ever around us. Feeling into these tender, beautiful hearts. As we continue to move throughout our lives, in our days, today and onward, can we hold on to uh, the, the energetic, the emotional, the felt experience of this right here, and not just hold on to it like, oh, we had this good experience, but can we remember it and continue to do the things that cultivate more of it in our lives. If there's any goodness, any beauty, anything of virtue or value that has come from our time here today together, may that beauty go to alleviating the pain and suffering in our hearts and the hearts and lives and minds of all people everywhere. May it go to our Asian sisters, brothers, family members who are experiencing unprecedented persecution in this in this day may it go to uh, our black brown every white every other being in this planet who is experiencing the challenge of this moment may we as a society live with greater love and in doing so work to dismantle the fear that so many in the society would like to continue to build upon May we be the revolutionaries for compassion and kindness that this world is so desperately in need of. And may we always begin with ourselves and may the fruit of our actions be a blessing to all those who we come in contact with. The wisdom in me bows and salutes the wisdom in each and every one of you. Thank you for your time. Ashe.